Understanding um, is that jhanas are these absorption things <laughs> that we need to really focus hard on and absorb in. This means meditation. And so nowadays it's even translated as a because of the commentaries and later editions. Um, but that comes from later texts which talk about uh, basically all kinds of levels that are not found in 
the suttas actually the, the, the Buddha taught and it makes it really complicated talks about apanna which is what is called absorption and now it's so popular that the word jhana even is often translated as absor absorption which is not a correct translation <laughs> and uh, my uh, my approach to this is uh, actually it's we're simply learning how to release the mind and basically there are simply levels of release that we go through These jhanas are simply levels of release and just for the record here i will read a very short sutta that makes it really clear that jhana is really not that complicated <laughs> and just by practicing what we're doing here is um, really uh, actually practicing jhana. This is the Pachara Sangata Sutta, which means finger snap, basically. And uh, it talks about loving kindness and makes it quickly. Even if for the time of the finger snap, a monk practices with a mind of loving kindness. I say that he is one who lives practicing jhana, one who practices the teacher's teaching, one who applies his instructions, and one who eats the country's alms undiluted. What to say then of one who would cultivate it? That was only for this amount of time. <laughs> So these jhanas, um, the samma samadhi, what I call the wise collectedness of mind, there's three steps in there. And uh, the first one is right effort, wise practice, then this is basically the action verb of the path. Then you have uh, wise awareness or samma sati, wise, um, I like presence. I feel like personally the word mindfulness is very loaded nowadays, so <laughs> I kind of, yeah, uh, it, it's a good word, but uh, I mean it means so many things for people now, so that... Uh... Right mindful is basically the four satipatthanas, and that's kind of uh, how we learn more and more to see reality. This is just going to be like the four frames of reference abiding places of our awareness more and more. It's kind of like the, I call it the byproduct <laughs> of the practice. We do the practice and then what happens is there is awareness arising more and more of these four things. And then what happens is that as we do the right effort, we become more and more aware, basically. If we put it short. Uh, then the mind goes through different stages, and these are called the jhanas, basically. And so the jhanas are like the map, the map of the mind. And the Delcraft actually has a, a book on that. It's called the Buddha's Map. <laughs> but um, uh, I also call that the, the jhanas, basically, just like the road map, basically, of what, what's going to happen in your meditation as you learn to basically stay with your subject of meditation, your vehicle of awareness, whether it's the metta, karuna, or <laughs> I get I have to get used to this formula still. <laughs> mm. And so when you are with your vehicle of awareness, which is going to be metta at the beginning, the spiritual friend, or uh, let's say the spiritual friend, and then uh, by applying the six R's, the mind starts to purify itself. I think now everybody here is familiar, there are hindrances arising, <laughs> whether they're uh, stronger or weaker. Uh, that's just the purification process happening. It's not, um, it's not really personal, it's just whatever was in the bucket is kind of coming out. And then actually we get to uh, have uh, more 
more space in our bucket for more awareness. So then, this meditation is very dynamic. It's alive. Uh, so it's not something that uh, is going to be steady for 10 days and not change at all. So that's why we have daily interviews, because there's a lot of things happening and we have to kind of make sure that everybody stays on track or that you get what you need every day, what you need to hear, what you need to do, basically. And so the, um, the talk yesterday was a little bit kind of an introduction to this, to understand where the Brahma Viharas lead and why we use that structure because the Brahma Viharas, um, they change. We can't bring the metta up to a certain point. It has to become softer. And just to know that is really, really useful because then we're not actually clinging to it. And when we know that we don't want to cling to it, then we see a further release, which is something that is, I've never found anywhere else. Uh, and so, Tonight is basically a, a more of a detailed breakdown of each level and its particular uh, <coughs> of awareness or object of meditation or subject. And I really like this uh, quote from Muji, actually. Um, all of what he says is not completely in line with everything that we do here, but uh, I really <laughs> like it. I was a follower of Muji for a while, and so um, I still like a few of the things that he says. Um, which do resonate with what we do. And here is, a, it's from his book, White Fire. The way is not really a way, it is a depth. It is not a distance, it is a deepening into stillness. Deepening in the unmoving. It is not a walking journey. Journeys are for the body and the ego mind. But listening takes you deeper into the bliss of the unknowable. And I really like this uh, this little quote because it we we I don't know maybe it's my Western mind, but <laughs> uh, we tend to see things very linearly. Like the path is like the eightfold path, and it's like a linear thing. But actually, it's it's more like a depth, and it's more like a release depth kind of thing. And it's learning more and more. And this is the the, the name of the talk tonight is befriending the void. Basically, it's learning how to befriend the void. So Bhante would say, um, every level of meditation, every jhana, is simply getting to stabilize and go deeper in the equanimity. What I would preferably call like calm, mental calm and steadiness. So this clarity of mind, vipassa, <laughs> that's what that means. And tonight is, um, I like this sutta, it's uh, the analogy of the cow. And it's, it talks about this inexperienced cow that tries to go into some pasture that doesn't know how. <laughs> So I think it's good. it's a funny it's a funny suit that I hope uh, I don't know, I hope we find it funny too. Let's see what the cow has to do. <laughs> and this is in the the book of nines in the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses. Um, that's where we find a lot of discourses that have the nine jhanas, or basically from the first jhana to Nimrodha, basically, because there's nine of them. <laughs> so if you look in that chapter, that's, that's where we find a lot of them. And uh, I apologize in advance. Uh, I'm reading from this computer. Uh, I prefer books, but uh, really, uh, right now it's not possible because I'm reading from my old translations, and they're not printed. Uh, they're on the website. I don't have any printed copies, and that would be a lot of stuff to carry with me. So, hopefully soon. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Just as if a mountain cow, who was careless, inexperienced, 
not well versed in pastures and unprepared, was roaming about treacherous high mountain grounds. She would think, perhaps I could go somewhere I have never been before, eat some grass I have never eaten, and drink some water I have never drunk. Then without having firmly set down her front hoofs first, she would begin lifting her rear hoofs. <laughs> her paws. She would lift up her front paws, uh, and before she puts them down, she tries to lift the back ones. Oh, uh, trouble. <laughs> it's a, uh, In this way, she would never make it where she has never gone before, let alone eat grass she's never eaten and drink water she's never drunk. Okay. I'll do like if I understood. <laughs> I'll just read my super. <laughs> and even if she eventually made it there, she could never come back safely. You can help me translate So, very good. You got a team. Such fact before finding two minutes, two steps, front, come. Yes. Can you just go back? Oh, I'll go back. Oh, back. Two steps, sir. Okay, we'll start with a rewind. Cow is uh, from the steps. Cow is from the steps. Cow is from the steps. Cow is from the steps. Okay, yes. Yeah. I can summarize. <laughs> so basically, there's this cow. She doesn't really know what she's doing. She's roaming in the mountains. Very steep, big mountain. No, like this. And, yes. And then she's trying to go somewhere she's never been before. And she's lifting her front paws. And before she sets them down, she tries to lift the back paws. Yes. So like this, she could never make it because she's just gonna fall on the first steps. <laughs> and even if she made it there, then she couldn't really come back. Why is that? Because she is inexperienced, not well versed in the pastures, and unprepared mountain cow. Similarly, monks, a meditator who is inexperienced, not well versed in the pastures and un unprepared, might want to practice disengage from sensory desires and detach from unwholesome mental states, still attended by thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of letting go, and might try to understand and abide in the first level of meditation. But that meditator does not indulge in or enjoy the characteristics of that state, does not, does not develop them, does not practice them frequently, does not settle into them until they become stable. Can you summarize what they so <laughs> Yes. Um, okay, so basically here we're talking about the first level of meditation, obviously. Um, there are these, um, basically, these factors, these qualities, these characteristics of that first level of meditation. And if, if a meditator does not indulge in them or enjoys them, and these, these are really interesting uh, words to be used by the Buddha here, uh, in these very characteristics, and does not develop, develop them or practice frequently, um, until this becomes stable, until this becomes like a base in the mind, which is seen and understood and experienced, uh, then, then something else. <laughs> then that meditator might think, perhaps I could, with the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization my mind becoming unified. Without thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness, understanding and abiding the second level of meditation. But that meditator would not be able to enter the second jhana, because the first jhana hasn't been developed enough. So it's, um, and I choose this particular sutta because 
it really points out to the fact that this is a natural progression and we cannot force this. It's only going to be experienced by patients, practice, and continually doing this. We can't just, you know, uh, sometimes it happens, we'll, we'll say a particular uh, thing that is meant to happen just to help just to people to see that. And then sometimes it's possible that a meditator will kind of try to project and create that experience in the mind, but that's not how it works. We can't create this. We have to actually do the practice, do the six hours, stay with the object, and it happens on its own. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> then that meditator would think, perhaps I could disengage from sensory desires and detach from unwholesome mental states. So now we're, he's trying to go back to the first jhana, like the, the mountain cow is trying to go back. Still attended by thinking and reflection with the blissful happiness born of a letting go, I could understand and abide in the first level of meditation, but that meditator would not be able to enter the first jhana. Can you summarize it? Yes. Can you summarize So basically, that person not having been able to attain the first jhana in the first place, tries to go for the second jhana, but that's not how it works, and it cannot make it to the second jhana, and then tries to come back to the first jhana, but is basically getting lost. <laughs> so, um, it happens sometimes that um, when we try to take a step too far, then we kind of uh, we kind of get lost a little bit. <laughs> so it's it, that's why we always try to emphasize to actually take it slow. Make sure that you have the bases down, and and then from there, then it will be a solid foundation to go up. So this is why, uh, in fact, in this particular way of practice, we have interviews every day because it's really important to monitor everybody's progress, make sure that uh, they're more or less, of course everybody's a bit different, that's for sure. Like Doug Kraft says, uh, you know, this is the map, but the terrain is very different. <laughs> it's like when you look at a map, you're seeing all these topographic lines and the elevation and you know the direction, the streams and everything from above. But when you look at the mountains and everything, it's very different. <laughs> and yet, uh, everybody is different, and yet everybody has very similar things that they must go through. Uh, and it will change a little bit from people to people, but really, generally, we can really tell. Uh, a, a general path, a general guideline. And so these uh, daily interviews are uh, really essential here because this meditation is so dynamic. It changes from day one until then, day two, day three, day four. It's always very uh, different. And so basically we, we do this so that nobody gets lost. And nobody gets confused, uh, actually, because that can happen, especially when we've practiced other ways of meditation and we try to mix things together. And then that's why it's really uh, good to have uh, daily uh, assistance. With so monks, this is called a meditator who has gotten lost in both respects. So didn't even get to the first jhana, tried to go to the second jhana and doesn't even know what the first jhana is and tries to go back there, but doesn't know. So, uh, I mean, it's a bit extreme. Nobody's done that. <laughs> Don't worry, we're all doing great. <laughs> this is not an example for you, but it's just a, it's just a basic template, basically. Yeah, you could be in you know, nothingness and then try to do something to get to neither perception or non-perception. It would be the same thing, basically. Trying to take a step ahead when actually it just needs to happen on its own. Now, monks, suppose there was a wise, experienced, well-versed in the pasture and, and prepared mountain cow, roaming about treacherous high mountain grounds. She would think, perhaps I could go somewhere I have never been before, eat some grass I have never eaten, and drink some water I have never drunk. <laughs> Then, 
having firmly set down her front hoofs first, okay, she would begin lifting her rear hoofs. In this way, she would make it where she's never gone before, eat grass she's never eaten, and drink water she's never drunk. And while making it there, she would also come back safely where she's come from because she is a wise, experienced, well-versed in pasture and prepared mountain cow. I like this bit. <laughs> With a bell, probably. In the same way, monks, there might be a, a meditator who is wise, experienced, well-versed in pastures, and I like this analogy of the jhanas, they're like the pastures of the mind, and skilled in being disengaged from sensory desires, and just closing our eyes, disconnecting from everything, and detached from unwholesome mental states, still attended by thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of letting go, and would understand and abide in the first level of meditation. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is getting fun. <laughs> mm. So you remember, uh, the first sutta I started with the Achara Sangata Sutta. Um, I, I just love to plug that in first because then that tells us that as soon as you have metta, you are disengaged from sensory desires and you are detached from unwholesome states. If you're loving, if you're really dedicated to metta, even for the time of a finger snap, you're not dedicated to sensory desires. Like, that doesn't work. And you're detached from unwholesome states. Anger. That's, that's just impossible. Like, you cannot have loving kindness and anger, anger at the same time. So I just love this uh, beginning where it makes it so clear that when you have the spiritual friend, we start with the spiritual friend, or the happiness, happy recollection, then it starts getting going for maybe five, ten minutes, Then you take a spiritual friend, you're feeling the love inside, you're practically in the first jhana. And of course, I'm not talking about the joy here, the um, viveka jang piti sukkang, the, the joy born of letting go, detaching, but it kind of comes with it. And that's how we usually tell, is we'll ask, is, do you experience some joy? Do you have some joy arising? And the metta is actually a really good conduit for that. Then that meditator would indulge in and enjoy in the characteristics of this state develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. And so this is why I keep saying to everybody, um, do you enjoy your meditation? <laughs> do you have fun? Because it's literally, it's written here, but uh, also um, this is really what's gonna make you want to stay there. What, it's like Bante would always say, like, what were the best grades that you had? Was it like the subjects at school that you really hated and you didn't want to be there? Or the subjects that you really had fun in it and you just wanted more? <laughs> so obviously the answer is the subjects that you wanted to be there, that you enjoyed, whether it was art or science or whatever it was for you. but. When you enjoy it, it makes it all easy, and then it makes it effortless. You just actually want to do it. And now, another interesting bit. Without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the second jhana, but rather by calming the calming of thinking and reflection with inner tranquilization, one's mind becoming unified without thinking or reflection, with the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness, one enters and abides in the second level of meditation. So it's not just a matter of <laughs> practicing the metta, but it's also accompanied with the six R's.
and the six R's will keep us always in the right direction because they will keep us from clinging to an object. So we will always go the right direction deeper and deeper and deeper. Then that meditator would indulge in and enjoy the characteristics of this state, develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. And already you see it's very soon and we already see that the meditation is changing <clears throat> because there won't be as much active thinking. And this is where the first time uh, Samadhi is mentioned for the first time. So that mental collectedness, which is really interesting. Before that, it's not even mentioned that there will be a kind of collectedness of mind because there's still active thinking and vitaka vichara. And also sometimes the second jhana is, uh, is where there will be a beginning of confidence. That's another way that uh, we can describe one of the factors actually. There will start to, this collectedness will bring in a kind of uh, a feeling of confidence because we start to feel that, yeah, we're practicing the right way. And this is also uh, what the Buddha called noble silence. So when you hear the word noble silence, it wasn't meant to be used as like a, okay, noble silence, like a noble, <laughs> it's actually the second jhana. Second jhana is what the Buddha called uh, the noble silence because there is no more vitaka vichara. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, I'm kind of enjoying the signs because it's basically telling people like, get the, first, the second jhana. <laughs> no, no, at least <laughs> so no, nothing under <laughs> noble silence <laughs> good <laughs> that meditator is thinking perhaps I could with the calming of coarser joy abiding in mental steadiness present and fully aware experiencing happiness within my body or ease within my body. Now the mind starts to really calm down and we start to feel it in the body too. And a lot of people here have uh, felt that. That state which, I'll just finish the, the jhana, that state which the righteous ones describe as such, steady presence of mind, this is a pleasant abiding. And I think a few understand already and will understand also. Uh, one and understands and abides in the third level of meditation. So without forcing nor pushing the mind uh, to enter the third jhana, but rather by the calming of course or joy, by abiding in mental steadiness, basically by imbuing all of these factors. And what is the non-forcing or not pushing here? You all know this. Yes. Six R. Apply karanehe. I don't know if I'm saying that wrong. Um, so yeah, and uh, this, this little sentence here, like without forcing, without pushing, actually this is what we're practicing all the time. And it's so amazing that it's saying that here because it's just like giving us like all the proof that we need that like this is the practice that we're doing right now because if there wasn't that then we would try to make up these states we would try to make them ours or to like fabricate them in the mind but that's not how it works so many many of you are familiar with the the arising of a hindrance and then we have to kind of like open up and sometimes it's like okay like this is or it can be big or it can be uh, or it can be small but every hindrance that arises when it actually gets uh, dissipated when it gets released then it feels so good and the meditation practice goes so much deeper and so usually here that's where Bhante would say you start to slowly feel some parts of your body disappearing <laughs> like you might feel that you you don't feel your hands anymore or you stop feeling your shins or your legs so don't worry that doesn't mean that you're actually disappearing <laughs> I <used> <laughs>
<laughs> I actually have never seen that before yet. I mean, if you want to try, that would be really awesome, but <laughs> I don't know. But that simply means that because we do the six R's, the releasing process, then mind gets lighter, it gets more uplifted, and it it doesn't want to be associating all the time with body anymore. Body is just this big clump of like really heavy flesh and bones and stuff like that. And it's got so many things going on in there, like ants crawling all over the place. And, and the mind is just like, like enjoying this uh, blissful state of the aryas, basically, that steadiness of mind so much more. And at that point, that's when it starts to slowly to detach. So that meditator would indulge and enjoy in the characteristics of that state. Develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. Then one thinks, perhaps I could, unattached to blissful sensations and unstirred by unpleasant ones, with the earlier settling of excitement and disturbances, balanced and steady, purified by unmoving presence, I could understand and abide in the fourth level of meditation without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the fourth jhana. So without forcing or pushing, but rather by imbuing the qualities of that state. I'm gonna do some fierce bridging here. <laughs> <laughs> that meditator would then indulge and enjoy the characteristics of that state, develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. So do you remember another name that we, uh, we learned yesterday to call the, what is the, the fourth jhana? Beautiful. The beautiful, yeah, Suba. So this is, this is that place where uh, metta only goes to the fourth jhana because uh, I've talked about this today quite a bit to a few of you but um, because metta is, is very involved and it's kind of involved with body also and it's very kind of a, it's an amazing thing to develop and this is kind of like the, the, the whole like thorough way of practicing this like completely uh, as it progresses through even the first four levels of purification of the mind still with the metta and it, it bears the name the beautiful for a good reason um, we've learned that uh, the, the new steadiness of mind the state of the aryas basically in the third jhana and this is kind of like the completion it's very this beautiful, beautiful steadiness of mind and tranquility, balance of mind. And it's, it's not shaken by pleasant or unpleasant experience anymore. It's just very steady. And so the metta, it changes through each, each of these steps. It, it kind of takes the shape or it imbues, uh, it soaks into the, each of these states. And so it becomes clearer and lighter and lighter and lighter. And at the fourth level of meditation, this is pretty much like the limit we can bring this to. Everybody got that? <laughs> good, good, good. And so here is where the meditation will start changing also. Well, it's been changing already, but <laughs> the vehicle of awareness or the subject of meditation, the Brahma Vihara, now changes. And <clears throat> This is where um, also the, this feeling of metta that was being radi radiated from the heart um, will slowly start to feel like it's, it's getting so light, basically, and awareness is really detaching from the body that then awareness will, we say it goes in, into the head, but really what's happening is just that because there's no awareness of body, it will just simply go rest wherever the resting, natural resting place of that awareness is, which is right here. 
And this particular sutta is, sutta is great because um, it, it's pointing out that um, if you try to do this, if you try to like, feel the metta in your head, it's actually not going to work. <laughs> it's like taking a step too far. Uh, because this thing, when it happens, you'll know, basically. Because it's, it's just natural. The mind simply, at some point, it gets released and it just naturally goes there. It naturally goes into the head. And this is a, a really important transition place because also in this pr particular practice, there's a few things that will change. And so that's why we have to make sure that this is kind of well done and uh, there, there's no like steps skipped. Uh, because somebody could, uh, it happens a, a lot that uh, someone would have that experience, but it's not yet um, strong enough, or it would try to like, and then because there is that experience, then there is like a kind of a trying that arises. And that trying is, is not what we want, is actually we want this to be happening naturally. So even though one experiences that, then it doesn't mean that it will uh, stay, basically. So we want to uh, make sure that we just continue the practice normally and uh, allow it to, uh, to take place naturally. And so also because of this, uh, this is where uh, we will start to radiate in the directions. And this is really going to be on interviews. Like these, these meditation instructions, be, this is the trick about this particular discourse is that it's, it's amazing because we get to see the overview of the path. But then also it's tricky because then um, we want to make sure that we're going through these steps naturally uh, without forcing. So even though you might hear something here tonight, then it doesn't mean that uh, you should try to get there. <laughs> it, it will, it, but it's, it's really helpful to know the way. So that's why we, it's a kind of a, it's a tricky discourse because uh, we want to make sure that uh, we simply continue the practice and then on interviews that's when we really will uh, discuss uh, what will happen for you basically uh -huh. oh <laughs> then one thinks perhaps I could having gone beyond all perceptions of form with the awareness of sensory impact fading away see that's like kind of like the withdrawing of awareness from the body Unattentive to the plurality of sensations, that's the bodily sensations. Aware of endless spaciousness, I could understand and abide in the plane of endless spaciousness. So this is why at the fourth jhana, usually we will tell um, with whatever is happening, if things are going right, then we will um, nudge along the change of meditation towards radi radiating to each of the directions, five minutes each, and then all of them at the same time. Because we're kind of uh, preparing the mind, basically, for the next step, like really opening up the mind. But uh, especially on a retreat, I mean, unless you would do an online retreat by yourself and you have really no guidance, then maybe you can try to figure it out. But it's really a lot better when actually the teacher will tell you uh, when that stage is happening and you're not going to like try to do it or uh, because then it, it can that that particular transition here between the fourth jhana and the first arupa jhana, basically is uh, there's a lot of things happening so it's good to have guidance and uh, make sure that you have a strong base you're not going too fast and then um, and then on interviews basically that's when it happens we'll, we'll talk about it and see what happens and then uh, foster the, the proper understanding basically so without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the plane of endless space but rather by simply imbuing the qualities of that state. One enters in, uh, upon that particular state. That meditator would then indulge and enjoy in the characteristics of the state, develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. This is uh, space. Ah, yes. Basically, it's the same thing. It's the same formula for every jhana, but it's just now we're in endless space. 
So fifth, fifth jhana. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's just uh, I'm not. I wasn't done. The <laughs> I don't know what's going on. So <laughs> you guys tell me. <laughs> okay. And then this is where um, the meta will not go further. It will have to. It will change. So it will dampen down. It will become more much more calm, much more detached. And you will notice a change of quality. And, but this is subtle, you know, so it, it, don't make a big deal out of this. It's not like you have to really feel like it's compassion. Actually, uh, like we said yesterday, this is the limit of compassion. So this is like the, the most subtle form of compassion you could ever feel. And actually the Buddha was said to spend uh, a lot of time, I think it was in the morning, uh, basically, uh, or twice a day, spending time in that particular state, sending boundless compassion to all beings, basically. DK. <laughs> so, so we talked about the awareness of the body kind of fading away, but what happens when uh, uh, this uh, occurs is that basically mind doesn't have a body. Like there's, there's body and then there's mind. <laughs> mind is aware of body, yes. But when mind isn't aware of body, what, is, what happens? Mind doesn't have any kind of sense of limit or anything. So the first thing that happens when we shift from physical reality awareness to just the realm of the mind, the first thing that we notice is that it's extremely spacious. Some people say that it's expanding. Some people don't feel like that. And then, because when we say it's expanding, then people kind of try to see that. And it's, it sounds really esoteric, like you're just like becoming this really like, wow, like fireworks and all that. But that's not what happens really. It's just like really spacious because you're not stuck in the body anymore. You're just like completely, mind has no boundaries basically. Then one thinks, perhaps I could, having gone entirely beyond the plane of endless space, that vast spaciousness, aware of endless consciousness, understand and abide in the plane of endless consciousness, without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the plane of endless consciousness, but rather by the going beyond the plane of endless space, and experiencing the plane of endless consciousness. So what happens here is that when we start to make that a base for the mind, when it becomes settled, when it becomes steady, that awareness kind of, okay, the mind has kind of taken a hold or imbued that kind of sense of spaciousness. It's, now it's very open and it's getting kind of used to that. And it's not really, um, it, it's ready to go beyond with the six R's and with time too. Here we're talking about, usually it's not, it's, it changes for everybody, but we would talk about an hour and a half of sitting meditation here. And so now we're getting deeper and deeper into practice. It doesn't mean that it's completely inaccessible if for sitting shorter, especially if you've practiced before in this uh, particular method, uh, you can access these states, uh, these states earlier. Uh, but usually, when beginning, that will uh, on the first retreat that will require a good hour, hour and a half at least of meditation. Okay, so what happens is that the mind is um, it's already spacious and it's it's gotten used to that state and. Now, as it goes deeper with the six R's, <clears throat> what it does is that it actually, it's, it's kind of so detached that it's starting to witness itself, the arising and passing of the stream of consciousness. And some people see flickers, but not everybody. Some people can have the insight that it's like a constant, like a flux. It is just like uh, always happening. It doesn't have to be frames or flashing things or anything, but 
there will be some kind of understanding that okay like this consciousness is just like endlessly arising it doesn't like it's just like uh, like a movie and you, you're not actually doing it you have the commentary and the sub commentary <laughs> <laughs> the atakata and the tikka that, that, yes somebody else maybe we could add the visudhi manga <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I was aiming for an hour today, but. <laughs> yes. Not saying they're not useful. I'm sure they are. I just, I just like to lighten up people's mind. <laughs> actually, I think it's great that it's actually translated uh, in Hindi. So. Or that's Hindi, right? <laughs> okay, because I hear here is Marathi actually in Maharashtra, isn't it? Yes? Uh huh. Okay, so I'm not crazy. Okay, I'm keeping with the, 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 uh, the flow of things. Good. So, what were we talking about? Somebody? <laughs> huh? All right, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and here, um, there are some really great insights to be had. Um, in fact, this is where like, there's, there's enough detachment here that there is starting to be really good uh, possibilities of seeing anatta, the impersonality uh, of phenomena, and especially the mind, where, uh, I just want to finish this a little bit. Um, where one will notice because of that endless, that's why it's called endless, is because one notices the endless flux, the endless stream of consciousness, and you just try and see, can you stop it? No. That's not, even if you say like, okay, I want to enter Nibbana now, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's not going to stop because you say like, okay, I'm just going to enter Nibbana now. <laughs> no. So, so it really gets to, and because we see it like really close and personal at that point, that we see, well, personal, I mean, I'm using that word. Not a very skillful uh, <laughs> word to choose here. But we're seeing really closely here that constant arising and passing away and this is just completely out of your control this is just arising and passing away so as we deepen this understanding hmm? um, personally I tend to say that I, I know that Bhante says that it's like at either one of the sense bases but to me I don't know, that doesn't really make sense because we just let go of the sense bases. So <laughs> I don't want to contradict, so. Uh, oh, was it in the, in the commentaries? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. So don't see, that's what happens. <laughs> Well, Bante would say uh, you're gonna, you can also see it as, at like a, the like a sound faculty, like the auditive faculty, or because he would say like musician would like kind of see that or things like that. I know he says that, although for me, I, I don't know, like I said, uh, I have a hard time with that because it seems like everything so far tends to say that we have actually let go of the senses. Um, and at that point, I think like this is just seeing the mind arising and passing away. That's that vinyana, basically. Um, I mean, I just pointed out because we are translating you. Yes. Ah, yes. Yeah. So okay, okay. I don't know. I'm 
trying my best. <laughs> <laughs> So, hmm. I was going for alms in uh, Nelson in Canada, and um, I was uh, I ended up uh, was never really successful, to be honest. <laughs> I ended up always in the free food banks. Uh, that's how I survived. Um, there's there's a whole big story around that, but I'm not going to go into that. But uh, there's this. Uh, this, this guy at the grocery store, it's like this huge uh, health food store. Nelson's great for that. And uh, he was, um, it, it was COVID time, and he was just trying to like clean all the doorknobs. <laughs> he was going around with this sanitizer. And he's, uh, I think he was from Australia, and, uh, or New Zealand, I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> and um, th there was this person in the bathroom, and he, like, he's basically like, he has to clean all the doorknobs. And so he's trying to get in there and he's just like sp spraying the doorknob and he's like looking at me and he's like, I'm trying my best. <laughs> it's like, um, so we had a good laugh together. Anyways, that was my alms round story. <laughs> it's just this like crazy COVID time and you know, like everybody's just like going like sanitizer power and... Uh, <laughs> So it was kind of funny to, uh, to lighten up the, the, I'm just trying my best. <laughs> and I was like, whatever, you know. <laughs> hmm. So maybe not, we don't have commentaries for that. <laughs> Hindi commentaries. Okay, so yeah, so here is the, the place where there's going to start to have some, some good detachment, actually, because that prepares us for the next step, which is a very detached mind, basically. And then, of course, one indulges and enjoys in the, the particular states, uh, that particular state. Then one thinks, perhaps I could, having enter, entirely gone beyond the plane of endless consciousness, aware of nothing in particular, and this is really interesting. Understand and abide in the plane of bare awareness or nothingness. I like to call it bare awareness um, because I, there's some slight tweaks here because nothingness can be a little bit too vague. <laughs> And so people can say like, oh yeah, I'm in, like I hear that all the time. There's nothing happening. Or I'm in, like there's nothingness or things like that. But it's not actually that state. So there's a lot of confusion sometimes when people hear nothingness and then they'll still in the metta or like the spiritual friend, then something will happen and say, yeah, but there's like, now there's just nothing. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but... <laughs> Uh, there should be something. <laughs> um, and the only real place technically in the, the jargon or the, the vocabulary of the path that is there, there's nothing really, this is that place. So this is why I change it to bare awareness because for me that's like something more, like it's a little bit clearer. There's just this bare Awareness, like awareness is still there. It's not nothing. There's awareness, but there's awareness of nothing, basically. That, that just like this bare kind of um, attention that's been rid of any kind of object. <laughs> so that's why I translate that uh, akinchana, akinchana yatana. Like there's. Uh, it's like rid of all of its qualities, of all of its all characteristics, or it's just like barren, basically. It's just bare awareness. Akinjana um, yatana. And I forgot to mention in the past uh, level uh, that endless consciousness, basically, we see that stream. Then the compassion also gets a little too coarse at that level. It will just fade away into a very, very peaceful, broad and steady kind of boundless joy. Very simple and that's the thing with the joy is that it's, it's so simple. It's just joy it doesn't have like a kind of an involvement or anything like that. It's just like, it's just shining. <laughs> it's just like 
Yay! <laughs> so, so it's just so simple. That's why it goes deeper. Because as we go deeper, it gets more and more and more simple. Anando. Oh, I thought I heard something. <laughs> so, huh? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so that's what I thought I heard. Good, huh? Good. Um, hmm. So yeah, that simplicity, like akinchana, like you know, it's it's kind of a trend also nowadays in the materialistic way, like uh, uh, like getting simple or like not materialistic, but in a, in like a worldly way, like simplifying things and like. Uh, so uh, that's why the, the talk tonight, I, I wanted to call it befriending the void because it's getting simpler and simpler and simpler. And that's why the word object of meditation is not really accurate at this point because it's not really, we're not really cultivating an object of meditation. We're actually developing skillful states of mind until we don't need anything else, until we actually like just soak in the void and uh, the further steps here without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the plane of bare awareness but letting that happen naturally and then one enters in it and indulges and enjoy and practices that continuously until it becomes like a foundation it becomes stable then one thinks perhaps i could having entirely gone beyond the plane of bare awareness understand and abide in the plane between awareness and its release without forcing or pushing the mind to enter upon the state this is the plane that is called neither perception and non-perception but i call it the plane between awareness of it and its release or the limit of awareness uh, i take that actually from morris walsh uh, it's not an original uh, the uh, plane between awareness and its limit that's uh, or its release is uh, kind of something i came up with because uh, i mean neither perception or non-perception is is fine but to me it's kind of chewy <laughs> so uh, uh, i don't know uh, there we go neva sanyana sanya is that ayatana <laughs> So, yeah, it, it's in relation to sanya, basically. Neither sanya nor not sanya. So, basically, here, um, in the previous one, uh, equanimity, radiant equanimity, was still possible because it's very simple. It's really almost like barely uninvolved. Um, Delson would say, like, it's like dropping a drop, uh, a drop of water in the water and just like seeing the ripples basically like uh, uh, expanding and this is like the that calm that calm just like radiating uh, but at that point the mind is ready to do that it has gone through all the steps because if we try to do that if we try to radiate equanimity without any training it's actually it doesn't work very well <laughs> if we doesn't we don't have the joy first we don't cultivate the metta the mind isn't stable enough to really radiate upeka so that's why we only do it here because uh, we need the joy we need the piti we need the sukha we need the metta the karuna the mudita and then we're ready the mind is really well trained to be able to support a really good upeka practice <laughs> it's getting is getting harder and harder. <laughs> yes. For me, I translate the Brahma Vihara of Upeka. I translate it as boundless calm. For me, it makes more sense. It's something that I can more radiate <laughs> in my mind. Uh, whereas equanimity, like I said, uh, it's kind of a, a dry term to me. But. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It's just really uh, up to you what, what that feels. And at this point, now in neither perception and non-perception or the limit of awareness, basically what happens is that 
we can't bring these uh, boundless vehicles anymore. We have to, uh, I say, uh, step out of the vehicles. <laughs> and uh, really, what happens here is that the mind is, has become so well trained and sharpened that it doesn't need anything else anymore. It just stays there and it becomes very, very steady. And that's what we call the still mind, the quiet mind, the exquisite stillness, whatever, uh, all these names uh, for it. But uh, literally, what that really is, is a very purified and advanced satipatthana, satipatthana practice, basically where mind is simply aware of mind itself. It has all the seven supports of awakening very sharply aligned, and it's just staying there. It doesn't need an object. It's completely stable. So that's what's happening here. And so the Buddha actually made it clear that the Brahma Viharas do not lead to Nibbana. They lead very far, and they are like the highway to, especially at the beginning, they will just bring you really quick, like even in a 10 day retreat, it's possible to go like really deep into the release of mind. But we have to step out of them at some point uh, because there at this very specific moment, uh, radiating equanimity becomes too intense for the mind. <laughs> it's another kind of doing and at that point, the mind doesn't need any other doing. It's so subtle, it just stays there. It doesn't need anything else. If we were to add anything to it or try to do anything, it would just disturb the awareness. And by the way, this is incredibly blissful. It's not like rapturous blissful, but it's something that is hard to kind of gather. It's not something that we experience in this world. It's something that a mind that is so completely released like this is that pure, beautiful steadiness of mind is this, there's nothing that compares with it, with anything in the world. Like eating a chocolate bar is like so overrated. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with this. This is like, this is free. It's accessible anytime. You just have to practice and it stays with you. It leaves an impression in your mind and it will carry on. If you cultivate it and stay with it, it will carry on and it will make your life so blissful and happy for no reason, basically. You just have to meditate a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> nothing can equal the bliss of that kind of liberated mind. There's just nothing that comes even close to that. And it's not, it's not strong, but it's just completely open and uh, without any kind of thing that can really shake it if it's maintained. So it's, uh, it's, very, uh, it's really hard to beat. <laughs> and so what happens now, and from actually the bare awareness, the, just the state before, that's when it actually starts, like the, the understanding starts that this is getting really good. <laughs> when the mind starts to become really steady and being like uh, letting go of the objects and, and all that, like stepping out of any vehicles and it becomes really effortless, then that's, that's when the mind starts to realize like, yeah, this is getting really good. Like this is really enjoyable, but it's not gonna be like an outburst of, you know, like a, worldly rapture or whatever that these words are translated of so so then we learn to indulge and enjoy and develop and do that frequently and until it becomes stable and that's why i named this befriending the void because this is really this is really like the culmination we're starting to see and at this point sits are getting long sits are getting about two hours three hours four hours, five hours. Bante, I've heard Bante, you know, uh, instruct people to sit for longer, six hours. 
Um, this is where chairs are essential. Uh, don't try to sit cross-legged. Uh, and this is where you want to start really making sure you get your exercise in. Bante at uh, Dhammasuka in, uh, in Missouri would uh, make people run up and down the staircase. Uh, that's just a classic. There's always someone going up and down that thing. And uh, while maintaining your awareness, so it's also a training. And it's possible, you know, it's possible to engage the body a little bit, get the blood going, get the heart beating, and still maintain your awareness. It's not impossible, it is totally possible. But one has to be obviously dedicated to doing that. So obviously when we start sitting for that long, then we have to start thinking uh, about, uh, you know, uh, exercise and the schedule a little bit because the, if we sit an hour and then walk 15 minutes then it's you know there's always going to be walking but if we sit a four hour block then there needs to be a little bit more exercise in between and that will really really make a huge difference in the level of pain that you experience and I would hardly like, I would really recommend that uh, everybody well experiencing or at that level uh, at least walk for minimum an hour like real minimum uh, I would say an hour and a half is <coughs> better and not slow walking this is the kind of walking that is like normal paced walking and uh, even maybe a little bit more because you want to get the blood running, you want to, your body to rejuvenate, basically. Because the body, especially when we're not trained, the body is, is, is not meant to be that stagnant. So it, it needs a little bit of activity, especially at the beginning. Uh, of course, you know, you can, you probably heard stories of people sitting in the road of Samapati for like six days or things like that, or, uh, you know, <laughs> but I would say these are, you know, these are beautiful things to look up to, but there's a way to get there, which might be very long. <laughs> and to try to skip a step might cause a lot of problems. <laughs> so I, I would definitely recommend that you take the good, comfortable, long road. And don't worry, I'm not gonna tell you to sit for four hours if you're not ready for that. We'll talk about this and we'll, be, we'll make sure that it's comfortable for you. Of course, I'll nudge you a little bit because otherwise a lot of people wouldn't even try. So I'll say like maybe I'll just try it 15 more minutes or half an hour more, do more walking, just, just a little bit by little bit and then at some point, we get to the longer sits. But I'm not going to tell you to like sit a, a four hour block from like one hour to four hours. That's just not going to happen. So just before you would stand up and that, that, that's for everybody now. That's, that's an advice for everybody, not just you know, this level. Uh, just before you stand up, before you break your sit, just have a look at your mind. What is making you break your sit? And can you six R it? A lot of the time it's just because the mind isn't used to sitting a little bit longer and it's just a little bit unsettled. It's like, ah, oh, I don't know, you know, like, I'm not used to this. Like, it's not like past an hour, for example, that happens a lot. And that's where I have to a little, little bit of nudging, a little bit out of compassion because I know that the deeper states are so much better. <laughs> and I want you to experience them. So that's why I say like, mm, just, just try a little bit more. And whenever, whatever the reason, because there, there is going to be a reason, there is going to be a reason for standing up. There's always a reason why you're standing up. So just look at the reason. There's always a little bit of tension around it. And just six R it. Just relax. Just instead of going like this, go like, ah. <sighs> <laughs> go the other way, go the other way, bring another smile, just laugh, just be like, it's okay, mind, no worries, it's all good. <laughs> just allow, be kind to your own mind, tell it, like, reassure it, say, like, it's okay, mind, it's gonna be fine, just 
Just smile, relax. Just extend a little 15 minutes, a little 20 minutes, half an hour, just see what happens. And actually, usually that little surface level uh, agitation is actually really easy to get rid of. You just need to like 6R it and release and relax for maybe ha half a minute, maybe 30 seconds. And then actually you'll, you'll feel it really dissipating and the mind will become clear again. Then one thinks perhaps I could going entirely beyond the plane between awareness and its limit, neither perception and non-perception. <clears throat> Understand and abide in the release from experiential awareness. This is Nirodha Samapati. Without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the release from perceptual awareness, but rather by the going beyond and the releasing, relaxing of the plane of neither perception and non-perception. See, it's the same direction all the time, it's just different levels of it. Then one would, un would understand and abide in the release from experiential awareness. So here, what happens is really interesting for those who are uh, interested in uh, all the inner workings of the mind. And we will start to talk a little bit more about Paticca Samuppada in the next few uh, days. This is like the turning point of, turning point of the retreat. And um, we will uh, discuss a little bit more about that. But here, uh, we start to see really interesting uh, things happening where this really steady awareness of nothing, basically, which is really interesting in the first place. <laughs> this bare awareness, constant bare awareness, which is really steady. It's been purified by the seven supports of awakening. And at that, at that point, we're basically just trying to, because there's no object, there's no, there's no real vehicle of awareness, it's just that. And that's why I call the satipatthanas the resting places of awareness. Because, and that's why, they're, that's why they lead to Nibbana, because they are completely effortless. These things, they are happening whether we like it or not. Like, if you stop doing everything that you're doing, you're not thinking about anything, you stop engaging in everything, the first thing that you'll know, that you'll notice, is your body. Because it's always there. <laughs> you're not actually doing anything about it. You don't have to scan your body. It's there. <laughs> you know the whole thing here and now. But if you do something else, that's when you stop being aware of it. So that's why it's so profound. Is because you can't be aware of the satipatthanas, the resting places of awareness, if you're engaged in all these things, if you're distracted. So it's that one thing that happens when you actually release and relax and let go of everything else. And I'm just plugging that in here because it's, we need that understanding to understand that here we don't need a vehicle anymore. The mind is mind. We don't need to make it mind. It's there. Whether we like it or not, we're stuck with it. <laughs> I mean, be without mind, be without mind. It's not going to work. <laughs> You only reap uh, misery and disappointment. <laughs> like the person that tries to dig out the earth from the earth. So basically what happens here is... Was it okay? Okay. So the 6R process is gradually now eating up at awareness itself. And awareness is not, it's not eternal, it's not uh, uh, permanent, it is fully fabricated. And this is why we're going to talk about dependent origination in the next few days. What comes before consciousness, vijnana, is uh, sankara, sankara pacheya vijnana. And that means that sankaras, like activities, fabrications make up vijnana and usually we believe that it's the other way around we think that these sankharas arise in the mind but they're not they're actually making the mind and this is where and this is really profound understanding by the way not a lot of uh, 
this is like basically uh, the knowledge uh, unique to the Buddhas, basically. So this is what makes the whole difference within the Buddha's teaching and a lot of different other teachings. And to see that is really subtle and really profound. We really need to, you know, like letting go of awareness itself is pretty, uh, it's pretty out there concept <laughs> for people who wouldn't never even think about that. That's why the Buddha said it, it's like uh, discovering an ancient city in the jungle that was like abandoned and it's all grown over and it was forgotten. But the Buddha has like, found that city again, that city of Nibbana, basically, that it actually exists. There is a plane beyond any kind of experience, and that includes awareness itself. So awareness starts dissolving, and that's what happens in neither perception or non-perception, the limit of awareness, is that there will be dips at that point because we are starting to let go of awareness itself so it's tricky <laughs> so how are you aware that you're still letting go of awareness it's you're, you're not really because it's like it's dissipating so you're really losing this and this is where the a lot of the sense of i-ness i-ness beingness my-ness meanness that's where it all resides this is like the the like um, the ultimate ground for ego basically we, we we think these things like body is myself and all of these things that are happening this is mine this is me this is myself and this i awareness is probably like the ultimate like i you know like this is really like because i'm aware of this like this is the ultimate truth basically but it's not. <laughs> and actually this is fabricated and there is a way to unfabricate it. There is a way to let that go even and go beyond ego, beyond conceit, beyond the sense of I-ness, awareness. <coughs> and what happens is that there will be dips because now when you let go of awareness then it dissolves and then there's no awareness. So. <laughs> So it, it gets kind of murky a little bit. It's a very clear, clear kind of awareness when it's there. It's the clearest awareness one can ever experience, basically, because it's rid of any kind of defilement, like the dross. Like that's why the Buddha compared it to gold, basically, like a goldsmith that's clearing out the, the dross, and it becomes very bright and malleable and wieldy, wieldy. And at that point, it's so bright and so malleable, it just it disappears, basically. And it's so subtle in neither perception and non-perception, we're not really going to... It's not going to be fully let go of, but the this, this sankharas that arise are so subtle that it's barely creating consciousness. So we just, at this point, we learn to automate the six Rs, the release process. And it becomes... We're basically like... Uh, this is where we're getting into like the operating system of the mind like at the deepest level we're like changing the whole processing of the mind basically and we're putting a new operating system which is like constant release <laughs> like the re release button is like stuck and we like tape it down and just go <laughs> like that's it that's that's all that's happening now <laughs> And, but we need to really perfect that because it's really subtle. We're going to come out and believe like, oh yeah, I, and like, wow, what happened here? And like, we start like engaging again in consciousness. And that will take some time. It takes a long time for awareness to really sink down and release into these states. And then at some point in the kind of muddy waters a little bit where there's a, uh, there's these little dips and then uh, there's these coming back out of it and as we do that awareness becomes very crisp and very sharp because it gets purified and at some at some level there will be a deeper dip <laughs> and the only way that we know this is when 
uh, consciousness start, start, starts up again. It, it reboots, basically, <laughs> completely. And then it's like noticing that it's like, oh, like there was n like nothing at all. And that's why another, that's another place that the, the nothing kind of vocabulary is causing problems because <laughs> there's so many things that we call nothing. So, but there, there's like complete release. Like there's no awareness. There's no experience of anything. It's, and that, that's why it's called Nibbana. It's the blowing out, the, the extinguishing of the fire of consciousness, basically. It's hard to describe, obviously, because there's nothing there. And even the word nothing is a poor describer. So, <laughs> and so the only way that one will realize that this happened is coming out of it. And that's what the Buddha called Pachawekana. We have this reflective view of what happened. And the mind will experience these three contacts. There will be the signless contact, the voidness contact, and the undirected contact. Basically, that's just saying that the mind, as soon as it emerges from it, it still has that imprint, basically that contact of that state, which was completely signless. There was absolutely no object, not even awareness, not even awareness itself. It was completely void. There was no self in there. This is complete voidness, complete liberation. And there is no direction of the mind. And this is also like no, there was no desire at all. There is no, like it's, the heart was completely, completely open. Like, uh, like open space basically, like completely open. So the mind has never, experienced this kind of relief before even sleeping in the best night of sleep you've ever had it doesn't even come close it's just a completely released mind and another i would say it's it's not in the texts but another contact that arises usually is joy <laughs> very wonderful joy of release and it feels extremely uh, good and it stays for a while actually yes yes like dropping the burden yeah yes letting go of the whole burden and then when the mind reboots basically it's gonna be happy it's gonna be like whoa that was amazing <laughs> and um, the more somebody cultivates that befriends the void basically the more the imprint on the mind will start to like uh, take room basically and the mind will more and more be drenched in this kind of state basically it can experience other things it can experience the you know the brahma viharas it can it can decide to do these things again do the whole sequence again um, but mainly there is more and more going to be a background kind of voidness that is accessible at all times or uh, the Buddha called it this, this abiding that he discovered that is abiding in voidness, sunyata and uh, I think Delson speaks of the signless samadhi well this is kind of what I call the signless samadhi is that it's when somebody's mind has uh, received this kind of impression and maybe like cultivates it a little bit, it becomes accessible basically all the time. You, one could just like sit in meditation and just like decide to just do that. <laughs> Nibbana ing, <laughs> verbing the noun. <laughs> <laughs> There's another word that the Buddha used uh, for that is um, uh, Vosaga Ramana. So this is like making release the object of the mind. So that's a really interesting word play here because there's no object obviously but release becomes the basis for the mind. So that's really uh, another interesting outlook on it. And so even though someone might sit in a chair and just decides to start Nibbana-ing, 
<laughs> uh, there might arise things in the mind, but at that at that time it doesn't. It, it's not actually a disturbance. It's just you know. It's just seeing it for what it is. Mind is simply untangling itself. It's a process. It takes some time, and one knows that it's just because one has been engaging the mind in the various different activities that the mind now is is active and then sitting down it starts to calm down and you, there's nothing to be forced it becomes really effortless it becomes really just sitting down closing your eyes and just letting it all evaporate basically until that state is experienced again one can still use the Brahma Viharas through the, each of the jhanas, but more and more this will start to melt into the four satipatthanas, which is seeing Dhamma as Dhamma, Dhamma Nupasana. This is just the way the mind works. The jhanas, we use right effort, we, we practice the practice, then the mind goes through these various stages. We're not really doing this. It's just the way the mind works. That's it. This is Dhamma. And the more we understand that, the more we take a step back from it because we just understand, well, this is just the way the mind works. And one won't even want to know which jhana they're in because just that wanting to know which jhana they're in is going to be a disturbance. <laughs> so they're just going to be like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> There's actually a sutta that proves that where Sariputta goes uh, out and he's experiencing the first jhana for a whole day and then he comes back. Then the Venerable Ananda says, oh, one thing, your features are bright and uh, what, what kind of meditation have you been doing all day? And he's like, well, I've been in the first jhana. And then the next day is the second jhana. And then all the way through Niroda. And then he... He says, uh, but while I was doing that, there was never any uh, conceptualizing that I am entering the first jhana, I am in the first jhana, I am coming out of the first jhana. There was never any concept of me doing this, it was just happening. And then the Venerable Ananda says, uh, oh, it must have been a very long time, Bhante, since you've pra been practicing. <laughs> So, which is, it's, it's true. <laughs> but yeah, like even the ego conceit or like the I-ness, the beingness kind of outlook, even on the jhanas, even on I am meditating and all of this, slowly it starts to wear away because it's just, it's just a burden. It's just a burden for the mind. So when we learn to let go of even I, it's so relieving. You know, we're not doing this, it's just a purification process. And as we purify, actually, the I goes away. And so we, we learn to actually really enjoy that. <laughs> Life becomes a lot less serious. <laughs> it's just like uh, bunking your toe on something, and it's like, <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> I was walking for alms in the morning in Sri Lanka, and it's like a barely uh, sunrise, and just like uh, bunking my toe and uh, it's like, oh, this one is like more than usual. It's like, like more painful than usual. And I'm like looking at my, uh, my nail and uh, thinking like, well, it's, it looks fine. And then later in the day, I'm looking at my nail and it's like actually ripped. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> and I just started laughing. <laughs> Be like, oh, <laughs> poor nail. <laughs> And so life is just, just like buoyant after, you know, like when you don't have an eye, it's just so good. <laughs> Everything just becomes so good. There's no seriousness anymore. It's just like, yeah, whatever. So, so upon this, I want to wrap up this talk. By the way, I'm not done with I completely. That's not what I'm saying. There's, it's still there. It's still there nagging me. It's, what can I do? I keep practicing. <laughs> That's what I encourage people to do. And then one, at one point, you'll see it. It's gone or something. That's what I'm being told anyways. <laughs> so here, I just want to wrap up with this uh, beautiful little sentence. And um, it's from another sutta. Uh, but it's talking about exactly this kind of samadhi that we're practicing, which it's a very rare sutta, by the way. It's a really, you have to know where, where it is. And uh, it only comes like three times in the whole Pitaka. 
So, uh, and as the Venerable Ananda basically saying this, he's saying, uh, how amazing, friends, and how unbelievable is this, that the beloved teacher, the Bhagavan, who knows and sees a trustworthy one, perfectly all-awakened Buddha, has realized and broken through to an opening in the midst of oppression, which purifies living beings, overcomes sorrow and anxiety, appeases pain and depression, and produces understanding which culminates in realizing Nibbana. This is very profound. And this sister asks uh, the Venerable Ananda, Bhante Ananda, what did the Buddha declare was the fruit of such samadhi? And he said, Sister, this samadhi that is not bent upon anything, nor pushes away anything, that does not come to the dead end of forceful suppression or control. Liberated, it simply stands there. Standing there, it is content. Contented, it is not agitated. The Awakened One said that the fruition of such Samadhi, sister, is final awakening. So this is my wrap-up <laughs> verse. I'm, we're done. <laughs> so thank you for listening, and uh, I hope this uh, helped and uplifted your, everyone's minds, hopefully. And um, I will be glad to see you tomorrow on interviews again. And keep practicing, keep going, doing the good work. Everybody's doing really good, so it's really beautiful to see. There was some questions. Yes, this is uh, actually um, the Book of Nines in the Anguttara Nikaya. Yeah, and uh, I didn't read the whole sutta. I just really read like the verses, um, and it's number thirty-seven. And my translation, I call it unforced samadhi. And this is all going to be available to everyone. It's just if you go on the website, you have all, basically everything that I've been reading so far, like the sutta translations, they're all from me. And so they're all for free and they're all on the website. So you're welcome to them. Good. Yes. Um, I spoke against the idea of annihilation once uh, uh -huh. the Dharma uh, is half dies. Uh -huh. What, I don't really know if I'm going to give you an answer, but what is like the alternative to non annihilation? Or so, alternative to that term, I should say. Sorry? What's the alternative? Like, if they're not, if it's not, like, it's not the annihilation in the sense like an atheist would say, when I die, I'm completely gone. There's nothing left. Yes. I heard the Buddha kind of spoke against that as a concept. Of yes. Well, th uh, this is where the, the Buddha says the, these are the things that he hasn't declared. That, that's what it's uh, known as. Because people kept asking him, like, is, does the Tathagata live after death? Does he not live after death? Does he, does he neither live nor not live after death? Does he not live nor neither lives after death? And something like that. And he would be like, I didn't declare that. <laughs> I didn't say anything about this. <laughs> Basically, what he says, though, is that there is the dissolution of the aggregates. And since there is no more craving, there is nothing binding any of that together anymore. So he says, after his Parinibbana, he says that uh, this whole universe, uh, the, the world with its devas and brahmas and kings and peoples and devas won't be able to see him. Nobody's going to be able to see him. And um, although that's his, you know, like so many things have been said around that. So it's like it depends on which tradition you're in. If you're Mahayana, there's like the Dhammakaya, basically, like the, the body of Dhamma, because he said also in his original 
texts that you know when you when you see me you see the dhamma when you see the dhamma you see me basically so and that's been interpreted that like well whenever you, like you see dhamma like that's the buddha and he's still alive and you know yeah, so it's, it can get kind of tedious <laughs> but, <laughs> but just to did he say, like, it's not a meditation, but I don't know what it is. Yes. It's, it's, he just called it Nibbana, basically, or Parinibbana. He says uh, in the, uh, in the Itiwuttaka, I think it's, uh, or maybe it's the Udana, I'm not sure anymore, but there's this uh, uh, sutta called Nibbana Dattu, and he says there's two Nibbana elements, basically. One with residue remaining, which means an arahant that has attained nibbana, like final nibbana, because because the nibbana I just talked about, just by the way, uh, people will come out of it quite quickly. I call it like the kiss of nibbana, <laughs> because the mind it takes a lot more training to stay in there. So this is not this is only going to happen at first for like. Uh, like really short period of time uh, so just by the way and so like it's not because someone is experiencing that kind of Nibbana that they're an Arhat that's not that at all but anyway so final Nibbana so, someone who here with the body it's also called the body witness uh, who makes an end of greed hate and delusion basically attains final Nibbana while still being alive in this human form is, is, is basically that's what it means, that uh, Nibbana uh, element with residue left. The residues are the five aggregates, basically. There is there's still body, there is still uh, sensation, perception, uh, thoughts, sankharas, and vinyana, basically. They're, these are still there. They're kind of together because of karma. That, per that person was born. So because of the body, there is still sensations arising, there are still perceptions incoming, there are still, there are still activities in the mind, there is still a consciousness, but there's no more craving in it. So when the body is, uh, breaks up, basically, uh, there's nothing to hold the five aggregates anymore in, into another life, basically. So what happens is just that, is that there's... Uh, and then there's the without residues. Basically, that's the other thing he says, the Nibbana Dattu, without residue. Uh, that's the element where the, an Arahant or the Buddha enters Parinibbana. And then there's the dissolution of the five aggregates. And that's it. That's as, that's as close as we can get to that answer. <laughs> okay. Mm, the question was... Jhanas, deep jhanas, yes. Mm -hmm. So actually, we that that's the four-hour talk we gave <laughs> in Bodh Gaya. <laughs> How long we have? Yeah, mm. yeah. We would make it on time for the precepts. <laughs> yeah. So, what did you say, Cleona? It, it was like um, my section was recorded and unfortunately the SD card was full for Delson's bit. But uh, basically, uh, and then I did another talk afterwards, like we, we had a meeting on the internet and I basically kind of did the part two of the Awakening of the Buddha. That's why we sit. Uh -huh. That's why we sit. It's not part of the card. Uh-huh. You are staying not recording. Yes, uh, it's, it's actually recorded. So these ones are recorded. And yeah, so basically it's because it, there's a bit of explanation to do around that. So and like actually, you know, when uh, Udaka Ramaputta and uh, Alara Kalama uh, taught uh, the plane of nothingness and the plane of neither perception and non-perception, they don't actually talk about jhanas. Like they don't, they don't give the jhana progression. They just say uh, through mere, like I, I, I learned the mere uh, lip reciting and verbalizing. Basically he learned the theory, the theory 
behind their teachings and it led to the plane of nothingness. It led to the plane of neither perception and non-perception. But they never explain that through the jhanas. That we have no basis for. And actually the, the actual first place where we see the first jhana is uh, in the Mahasachaka Sutta because these talks were based on the Mahasachaka Sutta and the Noble Search, the Arya Pariyaya Sutta uh, in the Majjhima Nikaya. And these are the two main talks that really talk about the Buddha's story on awakening. And that's when he says uh, he was a young boy and he, you know, he remembered like the plowing festival, seeing his dad, the king, plowing the field. And, he just was left alone under that uh, jambu tree and, uh, and then he just started meditating and because if you know the story of the Buddha in his past lives, he, he already did that in previous lives. Uh, he just didn't break through to Nibbana basically, but he did experience these jhanas that we're actually talking about here before. So he already had the mental like momentum for that, the karma for that. So he just sat under the tree and then he experienced the first jhana, but I mean, he was a kid. He was seven, around that age. And uh, when he was doing, like, uh, after meeting his two teachers and then he was dissatisfied with their, you know, because he said this doesn't lead to complete Nibbana, like, I'm not, I'm not interested. So, and then he started doing these crazy austerities um, with the Jain, Jain ascetics. Um, and then when he was like barely like almost dying at that point where he just like pushed his like basically perfect body which has like the 30 th 33 marks of like the, the, uh, of, a, of a good man basically of a, a great man um, t even that like perfect body pushing it to the very end where he was gonna die basically and then he realized oh, well this is not the path <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> Like, can, can there be like a, like a middle way? <laughs> and then he remembered that moment under the tree and, and, then that's, and then that's when he realized like, what if I were to enter a pond and abide in the first jhana, like the, the disengage from sensory desires and all that. But we never hear about these, that state before. That's really unique to that very precise moment of his awakening. He doesn't talk about that with his previous teachers. And I've heard, I've heard so many stories about, oh, it's because it was like they, they taught absorption jhana, or like, oh no, they didn't teach absorption jhana, they taught like uh, these were the arupa jhanas, and that's why he's always talking about only the four jhanas, but that's, anyways. I've heard so many stories about that, but the reality is we don't even have any kind of basis to, to claim that, because when these teachers teachings are explained they don't even talk about the jhanas they, they speak about the end kind of result which was the plane of nothingness and neither perception and non-perception and the thing that i was saying was that um for me for example i i've been uh, following and practicing in many other traditions in the past so uh, ramana maharishi and muji are people that i were was following and um they do explain things and practices that do lead to similar states of mind whereas there is this pure everlasting awareness that is your true self you know and then everything else you just let go and and you sit in satsang and you keep hearing this theory and you keep hearing these words and actually it does lead to a similar plane it does lead to that plane if you're actually dedicated like the buddha says when he was with these teacher he said well alara kalama has faith energy wisdom uh, some uh, all these faculties I have that too, so why, why, and, and if you take these faculties and apply them to these teachings, you, you're going to get some results too, but it's not going to be Nibbana, Nibbana, and it's not necessarily going to be through the jhanas at all, but there are ways of understanding that we can develop that will lead to similar planes, basically. So I think I'll stop here. <laughs> Very good. Good. That was a good summary.
<laughs> but yeah, the talk is recorded, so you can listen to that. Uh, it's not it's not out yet, but it will be on the Hard Dhamma channel. Yeah, uh, YouTube. I never heard of it. That talk, it's not, it's not there yet because it's from the Bodh Gaya retreat. It's, it's slowly going to come at some point. It's getting, uh, it's in the making. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. <laughs> so yeah, at some point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, the first one is out. The first one. The first, uh, that it's day four. The Awakening of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Yes, after the retreat. <laughs> <laughs> Did you give your cell phone? Did you give your cell phone? <laughs> <clears throat> good. Okay, let's share our merits and then good. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May being inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensations. Sadhu, sadhu. Have a beautiful evening and good rest. See you tomorrow at the interview. Keep smiling. Good.